My name is Winston Sang, and I want to welcome you to the Aging in Asia uh, webinar, the third part of this webinar series on ethical and policy issues in healthy aging and end-of-life care across the Pacific, Asian Pacific region. And this uh, webinar series and conference is organized jointly by the UC Berkeley School of Public Health and the Institute of Health Behaviors and Community Sciences at National Taiwan University with Professor Duan Rong Chen, and also with the Institute of East Asian Studies. Um, it's really my pleasure to welcome the topics today for, with scholars from China and Mongolia and the United States. And um, I want to uh, introduce uh, Professor Julian Chow with the School of Social Welfare who is chairing today's webinar. Uh, please welcome Professor Chow. Pr Julian, please go ahead. Thank you, Winston. Okay. Well, good morning to those who are on the other side of the Pacific Ocean. And good evening to those who are here in the area. And good afternoon or good midnight to those who are somewhere in between. And no matter where you are, what time zone you are in at this moment, here and now, we are all connected, united, and together. And welcome to the last but not the least of the three park sequence of the Aging in Asia conference. As we always say, we save the best for less. The conference, this tonight's conference um, is the third. We kick off starting in Taiwan, then move to Korea and Japan last week. And today we will be learning from our colleague in Mongolia, China, and Asian American or living overseas and living in the United States. So we have a full agenda with four presenters today. But before I'm going to introduce them, I'm in particular delighted to invite Dr. Michael Liu, the Dean of the UC Berkeley School of Public Health to say a few words. And trained as a medical doctor, Dr. Liu is a renowned scholar and expert in maternal and child health policy. We are really fortunate to have him to join us at UC Berkeley. So without further ado, let's welcome Dean Liu. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Chow. Uh, and it is my pleasure to welcome uh, the participants of the US, China, Mongolia, Taiwan, Japan, Korea, and other Asian regions on today's Asian in Asia webinar. And before I get started, I just want to give a shout out uh, and kudos um, to, uh, to our partners um, uh, at the National Taiwan University, uh, okay, with a special shout out for uh, Professor uh, Duan Rung Chen uh, for, for uh, uh, their partnership uh, in convening this webinar series. Today's webinar is focused on aging in China, Mongolia, and the US, and how that contributes to the trans-Pacific scholarly exchanges and policy engagements on global aging. As you all know, older adults are the fastest growing population by age globally, and has been the most adversely affected by COVID-19, the wildfires, and other recent disasters. Today's presentations about aging across the Pacific can contribute to how we think about transnational collaborations in aging policies to protect vulnerable older adults and how to address the various challenges older adults face from pandemics and disasters and how we can better support and prevent uh, recover uh, efforts and also plan for future pandemic emergency preparedness. We will also learn about some effective psychosocial interventions to support older adults in all ages in maintaining a positive mental health outlook in everyday life. 
Mental health and social engagement are vital components to extending healthy aging and coming to terms with end of life or a good death. We have a lot to learn for aging developments in Asia and how we can all work together on aging policies across the Pacific. I'm really excited uh, to be hearing uh, from our speakers. Uh, and with that, I will now turn it back to uh, the webinar chair, uh, Professor Chow, to introduce the presenters. Thank you, Dean Lu, for the kind words of encouragement and support. And certainly, in the United States, we can really learn a lot from our colleagues you know, in Asia, and particularly in terms of um, how we can maintain a healthy life as the society moving into more of an aging uh, society. And so what we will begin our panel presentations tonight. And first, just a reminder for the audience, um, today's section is being recorded. So you can feel free to turn off your camera um, if you wish, or stay that on, but we will be recording. And also to the audience, if you have any questions for the presenter, please submit your question in the chat box. You can find the chat box most likely in the bottom of your Zoom room, or you can expand your Zoom room and find the little icon chat. And you will submit your question directly to Jenny Chen. Uh, Jenny Chang, I'm sorry. So she will collect all your questions and direct it to me as the moderator. We will address them later at the end of all the presentations. First speaker is to start off from the United States and then we will move east. Professor Anne Singh from Stanford University. So her presentation is on well-being healthy aging in Asia and Asian Americans. Okay, thank you so much. I'll try to share screen. First of all, I want to thank the organizer for uh, inviting me and also uh, Professor Chow for a very nice um, introduction. Thank you so much. So today I'm gonna to talk about healthy aging and well-being among Chinese. And this is uh, uh, actually a uh, preliminary results from our Stanford Well for Life study. And I'm Ensign from Stanford Medicine. Okay, so Stanford Well for Life study, uh, this is a study with the vision of to improve and sustain health and well-being globally. Our mission is to accelerate in the science to enhance well-being locally and globally. Uh, currently, our study uh, are in uh, five study sites, and uh, we have enrolled 28,000 individuals, over 28,000 into the study. We have the Well Bay Area site. We have the Well China in Hangzhou in collaboration with Zhejiang University in Taiwan. We have the Well Taiwan One in collaboration with Fujian University. We were planning the Well Taiwan Two to collaborate with National Taiwan University. We also have a cohort in Singapore, and that's the well Singapore. Uh, in 2021, in just a few months, that we are going to launch the well Thailand uh, study. And in that study in 2021, we're planning to recruit 2,000 individuals into the study. We are now in the phase two of Stanford Global Well for Life study. Phase one was from 2015 to 2019. And then phase two uh, is uh, starting this year. And phase one is mostly about recruitment and phase two will uh, include uh, active follow-up and also uh, some uh, biomarker studies to uh, provide insight for biology for well-being. So the Stanford Well for Life study is set up as a longitudinal study uh, with uh, multiple follow-up going forward. Today I'm charged to talk to you about well-being and aging. Uh, the Stanford Well for Life study uh, was not really set up to study aging, but because we do have sizable number of elderly 
uh, individuals in the study. So that also provides a unique opportunity for us to study uh, aging and well-being. Because when we get old, actually I'm an aging person myself. When we get old, we, we want to live a meaningful and satisfying life. So in addition to just being healthy, we also want our life to be happy, to be meaningful. So here is the makeup of the uh, population in our study. Overall, uh, our study is actually over 28,000 and currently we have over 8,000 individuals who are over the age of 60. And of course, uh, some are in their 70s and also in their 80s, but uh, mo most individuals are actually younger than 60. But we do have about 30% of the population are older than 60. Because today, the, the conference and the webinar is focusing on uh, Asian in Asia. So I will actually focus more on our data from China, Taiwan, and Singapore. And most of these are from Chinese because uh, China and Taiwan are mostly Han Chinese. And Singapore, in our Singapore population, about 75% of the Singaporeans in the study are also uh, have uh, Chinese heritage. We also have the U.S. component of about 6,000 individuals now, and we also have the U.S. Asian American of over 1,500 individuals. But today, I will not focus on these data. I will focus on China, Taiwan, and Singapore. So in order to uh, assess and also measure well-being, uh, to understand the determinants and patterns of well-being. For the last five years, we have gone through a lot of qualitative and quantitative studies to define well-being. What we, this is what we did, and what we did was initially we carry out qualitative interviews in various countries using a grassroots approach to understand what well-being means to each individual in each culture and each country because they are population and cultural differences. From the qualitative interview of about 350 individuals from various populations, we identify 10 domains that are related to well-being from all these populations. And here uh, I uh, listed the 10 domains for you to see. I will not have enough time to go over each of the domains, but you can go to our website to look at the domains and we also have a lot of other information about the specific domains. From these 10 domains, we actually constructed a survey and the survey has 76 to 100 questions in different population. In some population in the US, 76 data items. In China, we use 100 data items to capture well-being because uh, our tool needs to be culturally appropriate and sensitive. That's why the number of questions are a little bit different, but the number of domains are the same. Therefore, from our survey, we uh, carry out quantitative interview uh, in over uh, 828,000 individuals. So those are the people uh, within our study. And we have 10 domains, as I mentioned. So we have a uh, domain score a uh, domain specific score, a score for each domain. And so for each individual in the study, we were able to construct a domain specific score using a rate of plot. And then we uh, used a statistical approach to sum up uh, the score in each domain for each individual. So for each individual in the study that we have a scale, we call Stanford Well for Life score, Well for Life scale. So each individual has a well-being score. And here is the density plot to show you that in each population, we are able actually uh, to plot the density plot to see the well-being, the world score distribution in different population. And we will use that in the future uh, to assess determinants and patterns and distribution of well-being in various population to provide further insight for future prevention and intervention. So based on uh, the score that I uh, just mentioned, here are the data to share with you. And here is the dens density plot by age. And so here we have uh, five different categories of age. And then the orange and the red are uh, people over 60 and people over 70. So you can see, now, in contrast to other health conditions, and this has actually been reported before, but we're very happy to find that actually in Taiwan, 
in China and in actually U.S. and Singapore, most of the population, when you get older, your well-being doesn't get worse. And actually, most data suggests that older individuals actually have better well-being, especially people between 60 and 74. This is really the golden years. And so it is a time that you really want to enjoy your life. And so for all of the data that it shows that these are the curve for different age group and the red and the orange are further out means that their score is higher. So we see this pattern in Taiwan, in US, in Asian American, also a little bit in Singapore. And in China, we do not see uh, the extension out for older people, but still uh, the red and the orange is outside of the green and the blue also suggests that uh, older people universally have higher uh, well score and higher well-being. So this is very encouraging. I really want to start this conference with a positive note. I mentioned earlier that we have 10 domains, so we also are able to create domain-specific scores. So each individual also get a rate of plot like this. And so the point of the slides is you can see the orange and the red uh, for each data points. Uh, the orange and the red line is outside of the gray and the blue and other uh, lines. So it means that not just the overall total score, that older people have better score. For each of the domain, they actually also score higher. And that is also very encouraging that older people, uh, if they have enough support and they have uh, in the right setting, actually the well-being can be very good. And so all of these things are things that we're trying to learn to hopefully uh, use the data to inform, to design intervention studies in the future so we can actually promote well-being in individuals and also in communities and to increase well-being uh, in all of the population. And here I'm sharing with you is the well score by education and by age. And here I have three different age categories, younger than 60, 60 to 69 and 70 and above. And so uh, the lines are, uh, these are uh, by different education. So you can see among 70s, people who are older than 70s, uh, the red line, the orange line, again, shows that these are the individuals with higher education. And so you can see the patterns for China is, uh, it's not very significantly different, but the pattern is people with higher education, usually they tend to have higher well-being, higher well score. And we see that in Taiwan. Uh, for the, very, the uh, people who are older than 70, the number is small, so uh, the distribution is not as stable. But for people 60 to 69, you can see uh, those who have better education, actually they have a shift to the right, so they have a better well score, better well-being. We also see that in Singapore, in various age groups, we see that in uh, US population, also in Asian American. So, uh, the, the key point from this slide is education does play an important role in individuals' well-being, regardless of their age. Here is the income. I am only showing the China data. Also, there is a shift to the right. So the score, actually, for older people, the score uh, increased from 53 to 59. Uh, for individuals between 60 and 69, the score went from 53 to 59 as well. So the pattern is the same uh, as the pattern in education is uh, individuals who have higher income or better income relative to their uh, peers uh, usually have a better and higher uh, well score, uh, suggesting a better well-being. Uh, similar, to, uh, similar to our expectation is the prevalence of chronic diseases, including diabetes and hypertension. I'm using these two as an example today. And I plot this by age, and you can see there is a increase uh, of the prevalence of diabetes in older individuals. 60 to 69 in China, uh, the prevalence of diabetes is 7.4%. This is self-reported. Uh, when we use the laboratory-based data, uh, we can actually see a little bit higher uh, prevalence. And for those that are 70 and above, it's 11%. And you can also see, uh, you know, uh, increasing trend with age in Taiwan, in Singapore. And so this is uh, uh, very consistent with the data that we see in the U.S. population is older individuals tend to have higher prevalence of uh, diabetes. And you see the similar trend as older individuals have higher prevalence of hypertension. 
In China, uh, individuals over 17 years old, the prevalence of hypertension self-reported is about 54%. In Taiwan, it's 31%. In Singapore, 53%. And so the prevalence of hypertension does go up with age. Why am I showing hypertension and diabetes here? Because I want to share with you that the well-being, uh, the, the uh, perception is if you have chronic diseases, maybe you don't feel as well and your well-being is not good. That actually uh, is not what we are seeing in our data. What we see in our data is, uh, if you look at the China data, you can see the blue one is the people without uh, diabetes. The red one is individuals with diabetes. We don't see any difference between the two curves. And also, uh, we see the same pattern uh, across, the, uh, across the age group. We also see that in Taiwan and in Singapore. So what it's saying here in this slide is the presence of diabetes does not really affect your well-being very much as long as uh, you, your diabetes is under control, as long as uh, the situation uh, is under control. And also uh, for hypertension, it's the same thing. Uh, for well-being, we actually do not see a huge impact of hypertension on uh, well-being regardless of age. And uh, we see this in China. We also see similar pattern in Taiwan and Singapore. So this is very reassuring because uh, almost a quarter to a half of the percent of the uh, half of the population have chronic conditions. But that chronic conditions, as long as it's under control, it will not uh, adversely impact your well-being. Uh, what is very interesting that we saw recently is we look at this data because of COVID. We have a question that we ask them, if you spend 10 minutes outside of your home every day, you know, and we want to know how does that impact your well-being. Actually, in China, uh, if you see the red and the purple, so these are the people who actually say they spend 10 minutes outside their home, uh, you know, and connect to nature very often or fairly often. Those people have a shift of the score to the right, so it suggests that they have better well-being and higher, better score. We also see the similar patterns in Taiwan. You see the, the orange and the red curve is shifting to the right. And we, uh, if you look at the scores, sure enough, the score actually uh, went from 50 to 59. So you get a 10, 10 points uh, increase if you spend some time in, uh, outside of your home and connected to nature. And so this is something that we can actually incorporate into future intervention studies for elderly individuals to encourage them to spend some time outside of their home and to be in the nature. So the summary is well-being assessed by Stanford Well for Life. Uh, Multi-dimensional score is better in older individuals. Individuals with a higher income and higher education tend to have a higher well score. Chronic diseases such as diabetes and hypertension are very common in Chinese in all three countries. However, presence of diabetes or hypertension has a very small or no effect on well-being. Spending time outdoors is associated with a higher well-being, and so we encourage elderly individuals uh, to uh, take up this practice every day. What should we do going forward? This is just a preliminary results that I'm sharing with you is what we will do is because we have tons of data from 28,000 individuals, we will examine determinants of well-being in older individuals to inform healthy aging. We will also conduct cross-culture comparisons to gain better insight into the impact of culture on well-being among elderly individuals. We also have a biobank of over 22,000 individuals, over 500,000 specimens. We will use those uh, precious uh, samples to investigate biomarkers related to well-being and healthy aging that will give us insight of the underlying biological mechanism related to well-being and good health. And so we will continue to work on this and we hope to have opportunity to share our future results with you and we will be able to work together to promote well-being in the population in elderly uh, locally and globally thank you so much for your attention this is wonderful so as the audience can tell and why we have change actually yeah, the order of our presentation a little bit <laughs> to get and to to start off with a promising positive note. <laughs>
that yes, aging would live well and healthy. Just go outdoor. <laughs> All right. The second presenter is going to look at research for action, identifying surface needs of Mongolian older adults and sustaining senior center in Una Bata. Um, Professor Yuyanga Beth Bethos. <laughs> okay. So without further ado, Yuyanga, go ahead. Great. All right. Well, thank you everyone for being in this presentation. And again, thank you for the organizing people and the schools that uh, gave us an opportunity to share about our research in Mongolia. I'm actually in Hawaii right now, Honolulu, and uh, I am very delighted to be here. And again, thank you so much. Almost 80 people are participating and so I'm very excited to be sharing about our presentation today. So, all right, so during my presentation, I'll go over these content, but I wanted to give a little bit more introduction about the organization and people that played an important role in making this research and action possible. So I am uh, from Mongolia myself. I lived there uh, most of my life and I'm educated at the University of Hawaii. My background is mostly in business and Dr. Catherine Brown is my academic advisor and the University of Hawaii was so gracious to accept me for my PhD studies even though I did not have a social work background. I am currently a third year PhD student and learning about social welfare and focusing on gerontology. And again, I appreciate all the professors and my cohorts who will continue to help me uh, to do better research and take actions. And East West Center, same, uh, had provided me guidance in 2015. Uh, th this organization uh, allowed me to come to Hawaii to look at gerontology, what kind of uh, services are available in Hawaii, and that actually kind of inspired me to go back to school to uh, learn more about gerontology. And Prolians is a medical equipment distribution company in Mongolia, privately owned, and played a key role in initiating this research, and which also gave birth to Quality Life, or in Mongolian language, we call it Chamertendril, which is a nonprofit really that started the senior center, and again, many more organizations and uh, um, individuals played a key role in that. So I'm so happy that on behalf of everybody who contributed to this research in action, uh, I'm um, uh, sharing the findings. All right. So as we all know, our older adult population is increasing and uh, significant increases happening mostly in less developed countries, including Mongolia. And just in, as, as an example, uh, you know, it took a France a hundred years for their population to grow from 7% older adult population to 14%. But developing countries like Brazil, it only takes tw uh, two decades or 20 years to, for that number to go up from 7 to 14%. So again, as a less developed country, lack of services uh, is a very, very big common uh, problem because it's coming but yet we don't have the resources to prepare for it. But anyway, we still have to make plans and prepare for it. So I will now focus on uh, Mongolia. So I'll give you a little bit of background about Mongolia. So we are considered the least dense country. We have huge land, but only 3 million people. And half of it live in the city that I'm from, Ulaanbaatar. And based on our own uh, poverty level, one third of our population still lives under the poverty level. So they are living about a, on an income of about $150 a month. Um, and so when the resources are limited, it is very challenging to focus on older adults. So when we look at older adults in Mongolia, it's right now only represents 6%. So if you take 3 million multiplied by 6%, we're really looking at 180,000 people who are considered older adults right now. And, but uh, we know that based on what's the projections, by 2050, not very far from now, it's gonna be 19%. One fifth of our population is gonna be older adults. And so right now, even though the retirement age is slight, uh, increasing little by little, 
uh, right now, women in Mongolia are tied at 55. And so if you have also given more uh, birth to many children, like four children or more, you can even retire at 50. So for men, it's a 60. So, you know, again, uh, this laws, our current laws make it mandatory for you to retire first. And then, yeah, can, yes, you can maybe work for private sector, but not so much for private sector because there's so many unemployed younger generation waiting to get job. And at, at the, even before COVID, unemployment is already at 6%. So for older adults, the primary income we have is uh, uh, social security. Again, about $150 a month uh, or less is what the older adults get from the government for working uh, many, many years. And they rely on bank loans, what we call it pension-backed bank loans to cover some medical costs or tuition for their children, et cetera. And again, about 70% of our older adults still live in an urban setting. So in a country like Mongolia, with limited resources, our government is ch uh, challenged to just, you know, with many, many issues, how do we prepare for aging, especially healthy aging? So we um, look at, we make a research and take an action and see if it's working. You know, do one cycle and do another research and then come up with an action. And again, we hope making baby steps, trying to see if we can do a better job of preparing that 19% older adults projection coming up pretty soon. So I'll go over these uh, research a little bit detail in my uh, next slides. So in 2015, after visiting Hawaii, looking at different uh, um, uh, you know, uh, senior uh, services available, we went back to Mongolia and started asking, okay, what services do you need? So we went around to 10 different sites, different districts and community, including one rural um, city that's outside of Ulaanbaatar and asked, we had a survey and it took us about three months to survey uh, throughout Ulaanbaatar and we basically first had to show a presentation of what services is available in the countries like Hawaii or a you know, city like Hawaii. So these included nine things, so, you know, home care, medical home care, like a social home care where you have a companionship coming just to help you, transportation. And then we also daycare, but with more social model but, or medical model or nursing homes or assisted living or independent living. So there were nine questions and people had to say low need, medium need or high need. But at the same time, at least they had to say, okay, from all these nine things, what is your most important service you need? They had to rank it from that nine thing. But we had to show presentation, like what does nursing home looks like? Because we didn't really have uh, all these services except a little bit of home care. We didn't have that. So we had to show, look, okay, what does assisted living look like? Kind of like that to kind of to give them example what it's, uh, uh, could these services look like? And then we also asked, okay, from the thing that you marked the most important, are you able to pay for that? Was that the question? And then there was a couple of open-ended questions, including right now, what is your most co biggest concern? and then they had to write in response. So, so um, again, this is just a small picture of my first community meeting, you know, uh, collaborating with the government official who provided us this contact, inviting the community members to come. And uh, so, all right, so the results showed, again, we're so thankful 400 uh, people participated in this survey and 73% were women. And again, uh, most Mongolians right now live with their family. Only 8% live alone. And when we ask the question, what do you currently do during your spare time or what do you do most of your time? 33% just replied, we take care of our grandchildren. That's our primary duty. And only 18% said they now either currently have a, a part-time or full-time job. So, so out of that nine things, uh, the service need priority, retirement community assisted living uh, was up, uh, you know, was high. But we were very, very surprised this daycare social model, just a place to uh, socialize with other people 
came out as a priority item. And of course, home care medical was also um, one of the top priorities. So to the question about the ability to pay, only 41% said yes for the item that we uh, consider to be um, very high priority, we are able or willing to pay for it. So rest of them, they said no, or maybe. So, and then uh, from the most biggest concern, again, a low income for themselves or for their family was one of the biggest concern, but also of just lack of services. They felt like after they retire, there was very limited thing they could do, even though they wanted to do more, or be more socially engaged and everything. So, so what do we do? Okay, we found out these are the needs, but what do we do as a person who asks for a question? Okay, well, now we know what, what they need, but yet they can't pay for it, but yet they need a place to meet or these are the services. So a team of Prolian staff got together and set up a nonprofit called Quality Life or Chamarte Andril, which gave birth to the pilot senior center in Mongolia. So we started with a very limited um, operation one or two times a week. And we just allowed people to come and play cards, teach them new games, especially board games. Even though board game is not a common thing in Mongolia, we used our East West Center alumni network to get some um, board games that was what we call game-based learning to teach people not only socialize, but teach them English. So all these ladies are learning all these words that used in the game so that they, they were just so eager to learn English and uh, you know, helping each other, doing very, uh, you know, picking together kind of like that. So, so during our about three initial years of pilot, uh, the way it was sustained was the Prolians provide the in-kind support of the staff. So the staff worked mostly at Prolians full time, but then they uh, devoted or donated their once a week time at the senior center to teach and stuff and the local government provided the meeting room so we provided only like very small core program including board game dancing teaching english and craft and guest speaker session was a very also popular so but similar to u.s uh, senior centers um, again primarily 95 percent of the participants were women and they were highly educated people former lawyers doctors and teachers and when we tried to ask for some little bit of donation to cover for the supplies and games, people really had hard time to pay for it. Again, a thousand turek a day was a donation, which is about um, about like thirty cents per day. Is we tried to get a donation, but it, uh, people had difficulty paying for that. So through the three-year process, we tested this model at six different sites. About 150 seniors uh, came there on a routine basis at a different, but it didn't happen all at the same time at different sites, but sustainability was still a challenge. So, so how do you tackle the low income situation? That was the biggest concern. So Prolians again came with an idea, okay, how about we set up a new business, uh, like I said, just a commercial laundry and hire older adult people because the younger generation wasn't that maybe interested, but again, we weren't competing with younger generation to create jobs and we set up a new business or we partnered with the coffee shop owners to say, okay, can we use your room once a week to have a board game cafe so that we can allow our seniors or older adults to be there with other people, also get a little bit of generation of money. So we tried that. And then we also got a small grant from the government or the community organization to pay a little bit of money to the seniors to spend some time in the community organization, such as schools. So about 70 seniors got temporary jobs. So again, continue with the senior center where we can't collect any money. There's no fee coming in. We, on the side to sustain the operation, we had to try different things, including even bringing Mongolian beekeepers to Big Island in Hawaii to work so that we as a nonprofit get a little bit of fee from helping with the translation and everything. And also getting East West Center, a uh, small grant. So we took board games to rural community in Mongolia, three provinces and trained people to learn about how, what board game is and using that as a socialization 
model and yeah, allowing people to socialize, but at the same time, get to know each other and uh, stuff like that. And again, private donation played a key role in making this possible. So, all right. So Dr. Catherine Brown and I followed, followed up with the second research, went to Mangala during the summer, and we uh, had a focus group with the senior center participants and the key stakeholders. So as you can see from this picture, uh, you know, we had the board members and staff who are all volunteers. They don't get paid. We do give a little allowance for transportation for the staff who runs it and stuff. And the government officials who are very supportive um, in helping us to have this and, the, you know, um, the community members. So, so the results showed that primarily our older adults came to senior center to avoid loneliness, even though they lived with their um, parents, you know, children and gra grandchildren, but also to self-development. They loved to learn new stuff. Uh, even at 90 years old, they loved learning English or learning something new. And among the, the four or five pro key program, board, playing board game was something they really enjoyed. But having only one or two sites, and they have to travel to long ways, about 40 to 50 minutes on the bus to get to a senior center was a difficult barrier. And family obligations, you know, somebody got sick or the, after school, they have to pick up the grandchildren. It, those things were difficult. And then also their own health was a big barrier to participate. So for those who went to uh, the senior center for over a year, they all reported better health. They slept better, they were happier. And the social engagement of just being, having something to, uh, to look forward really was encouraging to them. So about the sustainability, you know, everybody we interviewed and talk, talked about how important it is to have champions and supporters. So from the six sites, for example, we had a, we worked with the government meeting room and only two really operated more than a year or almost two years because that government people actually supported us to make sure that we had a room to meet, not canceling our rooms and things like that. But other four sites, even though we had provided the resources, it did not last. It was just, it was difficult to find meeting place. They would cancel and things like that. But anyway, one other thing we have learned is that to sustain a senior center, we really have to show that this is not just benefiting the seniors. It's benefiting the whole, whole society, how that better health comes and, you know, they are able to take care of their grandchildren or even living longer and being productive. Those things were we had to show the benefit in order for the senior centers to continue. So I want to emphasize, as of even today, our sustainability of pilot senior center is still a struggle. It is it's completely run by volunteers, and we always have to look for places to meet and everything. So it's, it is a challenge. But uh, overall, you, during this research, we learned that all services are needed. Uh, but seniors themselves at the moment not able to pay for that. So the, during the four or five years of pilot, we kind of said it with a, not a lot of money or innovative low cost model is possible, um, but we need to also learn about how to deliver other services. And then as far as creating jobs and to help people to get a more income, Business collaboration seems more sustainable when we're just doing grant related stuff and trying to employ them and, uh, you know, the schools or the community. Yes, it works for a couple months, but as soon as the grant finishes, that, uh, that doesn't seem to be sustainable. And then I think the last thing is realizing that um, uh, our seniors, older adults, uh, really underutilized asset was uh, something that we uh, want to continue to emphasize. So as an action researcher, we, with the help of our you know, community and academia and everything, considering Mongolian current economic situation and social um, context, we can't really like ask the government or give us more money or, you know, you know, give us, you know, instead of asking for grants only, at this point, we feel like the social enterprise supporting the certain, um, uh, or, you know, people, especially older adults to uh, be part of the solution and starting and sustaining services is the best way. And then instead of just having narrow focus of only senior center, 
having a community center where there's intergenerational activity and engagement is promoted so that the whole overall community benefits will be the best next action. And again, um, this is a, just a, a, a picture of all the ladies from our first um, senior center and, uh, and on behalf of the, all the seniors and everybody, I just wanna thank all the people who contributed to making this possible, especially the school, because every class I go, I learn something new about gerontology and every action we take a little bit in Mongolia, it comes from the people who mentor us and contribute to us. So thank you so much. Okay, great. So we are moving further east. And again, uh, for the audience, Please submit your question uh, chat to uh, Jenny. Okay, so we will then uh, have a whole discussion at the end of the presentations. So the third presenter or presentation entitled Addressing Needs Triggered by the COVID 19 Pandemic Emerging Response Plan of health and long-term care for older adults in China. Uh, Professor Xiaoting Liu from the School of Public Affairs in Zhejiang University. Okay, uh, thanks to the organi organizer, the invitation, and thanks very much for Julian's brief introduction. Today, it's my great honor to share one of our research on the need assessment for Chinese older people, especially during and after the COVID-19 pandemic all over the world. So uh, this is the major content. And uh, in the background, I will introduce the COVID-19 pandemic as a background and how about the unmet needs for older adults in China. As far as we know, the COVID-19 pandemic is a global challenge now and impacts nearly all the countries all over the world. And according to the demographic, uh, trends of COVID-19, uh, both confirmed cases and death cases in China. So although only 31% uh, confirmed cases are older people aged 60 years old and over, however, more than 80% deaths are from the older adults. This is the data in China. And we also found another data in the United States. Um, the United States showed the similar pattern that uh, almost 80% of the death cases are older people aged 65 years old and, and over. So the question is why the older people are much more vulnerable during the COVID-19 pandemics? Why they have the higher risk to uh, uh, be infected by the virus. Uh, I think the there are some reasons in the literatures. Uh, some re reasons are because of their developing uh, immunity and they are uh, frail and most of the older people uh, have more than one chance of the chronic disease. So um, when we're talking about the vulnerable of older people during the COVID-19. So we have to deal with two challenges. Um, the first challenge is that we have to protect the older people to against uh, the virus infection. And the second one is very important in China because the Chinese government implemented very, very strict quarantine measures to mitigate the spread of virus. So that situation make a lot of dilemma for older people. For example, produced a lot of psychological uh, problems uh, such as uh, isolation and also there is inconvenient for the older people to buy their life necessities and the food. So 
Uh, based on this background, we conceptualize three basic needs for older adults. These basic needs, both in the normal states and in the abnormal state. Abnormal state, that means um, during the period of social crisis, such as the public uh, health uh, emergency. So the three basic needs are the basic living needs uh, and the basic medical needs or health needs and the basic long-term care needs. So uh, on the basis of these three basic needs, we raised the uh, research question. So we are considering how could we construct a comprehensive elderly care needs assessment model, especially during and after the COVID-19 pandemic to integrate it fragmented system in China. You know, in China, in Chinese administrative structure is very fragmented. Many departments are in charge of the elderly care issue. So we separate this research question into two stages. The first stage is in the normal stage, how to construct a comprehensive integrated model, need assessment model. So we have to solve two problems. First is how to integrate the cognitive and the physical function in the need assessment models. Because in the previous, uh, in our previous systems, we only focus on the ADL, IADL to represent or to measure the physical function while ignored the cognitive function of the older people. So at this stage, we have to integrate this cognitive and physical function. The first the um, task is to integrate the health care and the long-term care. Uh, you know in previous system is separate. So we want to integrate the two systems um, in our need assessment system. That's the in the normal stage. Well, how about in the no abnormal state, our question is, what are the unmet needs in health and long-term care aspects for older people during the crisis? So we concern about how do different subjects respond to addressing the special needs for older people and how to initiate an emergency response plan, we call that ERP, especially for elderly. So to answer these questions, we construct a framework the purpose of the research is to provide a comprehensive elderly care need assessment model. So we divide that into two parts. In the normal stage, there are two integ integration, integrate cognitive and physical function, as well as the health and long-term care integration in our need assessment. Well, plus in the normal state, we have to identify some special basic needs for older people, then we establish an ERP for older people. Then we apply this model both into communities as well as in the institutions. So in the first stage, uh, it's the normal stage. So uh, how to can establish a comprehensive need assessment model. Um, as the population aging, China become the largest countries to have the most people with dementia. So from some medicine literatures, there are some association, very close association between cognitive impairment and their future disability because they share some common mechanisms. For example, um, both the physical and cognitive impairment impaired people share some risk factors such as chronic disease, cardiovascular disease, and so on. So um, our research, our project, in our project, we collect the diverse, uh, we collect 1,000 1, samples in very diverse institutes. They are the nursing homes, the hospitals, rehabilitation hospitals, CCRCs, community elderly care centers, care centers for disabled. So uh, we use a long-term care insurance questionnaire to measure 
uh, physical and functional disability. We use ADL and IADL to measure the physical function. We'll use a brief MMSE to measure the cognition. So uh, these two slides shows the sample characteristics. Okay. Then uh, looking at the bar chart, uh, is the physical and the cognitive function ability separately? The left, in the left bar chart is the uh, ADL scores. Uh, the zero means healthy function and the higher uh, score means the worst um, status of, the, of their disability. Uh, and the, the Nearly 25% older people have very severe problem of the of physical disability, while nearly 22 have very serious cognitive uh, function problem. So uh, after the descriptive analysis, uh, we applied so, uh, structure equation modeling while controlling for some um, variables, uh, we got this model. Uh, according to this SEM model, we can see this right square. So this square showed the pass coefficient. So the pass coefficient value uh, from the cognition to the physical function, the value is much more higher than that from the physical to the function, uh, cognitive function. So that means cognitive uh, have uh, should have a uh, higher weight in our models. So based on this SEM model, we reconstruct a new need assessment model to using a logic tree model. So in this logic tree model, a uh, cognition as a filter. So in our previous uh, systems, we will use the ADL, IADL scores plus MM. SE scores to represent their disability degree. But uh, here in our new models, we construct the logic association between the cognitive function and the, the physical function. So if the cognitive health is better uh, and the uh, impairment, they go to the different paths, then the second stage, we look at the physical function. Then we are looking at uh, whether they have some problems in assist assistance with their uh, daily living, uh, including the bathing, eating, dressing, and something so on. So um, from by the help of the logic tree model, we construct uh, the integrated need assessment model of the cognitive function and the physical function. So we use that to represent the long-term care needs for older people. So how about their health needs? Because health as well as the long-term care, they are the major needs of the older people. So we conduct another uh, project to, to test to integrate the healthcare and the long-term care need assessment. So here, to, we would like to break down the division by different departments at community levels. Uh, so we collect 185 samples in two um, communities, uh, also in Hangzhou. Hangzhou is, one of, is the capital of Zhejiang province. Zhejiang is the rich, one of the richest areas uh, in China. So our project, uh, previous project one, also we collect the data in Hangzhou, Zhejiang province. So all the samples are, have some problem of the disability. We test their health uh, needs. So we use this questionnaire from Taiwan, not except for some the social economic informations, uh, ADL and IADL and cognitive ability. The questionnaire also have the contents of the basic health data, the disease diagnosis, uh, prescribed medicine and the home environment. So uh, these two tables also showed the sample characteristics. Okay. 
is from the descriptive data analysis, uh, we can see a very higher uh, prevalence of the chronic disease. For example, the hypertension, the coronary disease, and the diabetes. Because most people have some problem of the chronic disease, so that's why they have a very higher demand for the health a consultant. So look at this bar chart. The higher demand is the preventive health care, health care advisory, health management, health education. It's very surprise. They need the public health service more than that of medical service. And we also go to the nursing care. Except that the health care, we also have to test their nursing care. So most people are in need of general nurses. I will sum that in the next slide. So it's a, a quick uh, sum, uh, summarize, summarization of the project two. The medical care needs of older people are uh, concentrated in general nursing service, including injection, catheter, and blood test. And healthcare consultant and nutrition. Nutrition is very also very important because in our data, nearly 30% of people have some problems of nutrition. So that's why they are more in need of preventive health care and health advisory and the instruction in drug uses uh, because the uh, the drug abuse problem is very serious in China, as well as the health management and the health education. So by now, we have integrated the long-term care needs, and we also considered the health care needs and the nurses. So uh, how to construct, I mean, how to operate uh, this system. So we construct a model. Uh, the data, we have the diverse data sources. When the data that means cases came into this data platform, um, that's why the county level uh, department, the county level department make a management center. This center gave the need assessment. It's an integrated need assessment. And they will send the orders to their providers. So here are multiple providers, including hospitals, community health centers, community elderly care centers, NGOs, nursing homes, and the daycare centers. So uh, they are the multiple providers to co collaboratively work together to provide the professional care to the older people who are living at home based on the integrated comprehensive need assessment. So after I uh, establishment the need assessment model in the normal stage. How about the special needs of the elderly during the COVID-19 and what's the China's response? We connect another project by the help of Zhejiang CDC. Uh, here we select five cities in Zhejiang province to give the in-depth interviews uh, to interview the government staff, the doctors, the dean of nursing homes, and the caregivers uh, to get their individual experience. You know that China uh, launched a very strict uh, policies during the COVID-19. Uh, so how about the nursing homes? The nursing home were closed very immediately within two days. And the community residence committee controlled the entries very strictly. So social policy also are intensively carried out, both from the central and from the local government. Uh, and the material supports, as well as some social supports under collective central leadership is very efficient. So as a result, the older people are more uh, safe at home and at nursing homes. The problem is, what are the special needs under such very strict restriction for older people? So also go back to the three basic, living, basic needs. According to the basic living needs, they would like to purchase life necessaries and other preventation products. And about health needs, they 
want to purchase medicine to see a doctor, but most of the hospital closed, only treat the patients of the COVID-19 virus. Uh, so the general medicine uh, needs not, uh, is not unmet by our uh, health system. And the third one is the psychological needs, such as the sense of safety and the emotional support. Uh, they need some psychological consultants. So uh, by our uh, qualitative data, so we uh, concern about the elderly's special needs. We ask the policymakers, the manager of the nursing home and the doctor in the community health centers. The policymaker during the epidemic so uh, every institute is very lack of some uh, materials. So the policy makers um, have to allocate these resources to the institute. And for the manager of the uh, nursing homes during the epidemic um, period, so buying medicine is a major demand of the elderly, you know, for Chinese people, it's a culture. So buying medicine um, means safe. They have uh, stored a lot of uh, medicine. That means they will feel uh, very safe. So uh, a lot of people need to buy in medicine. So the nursing home have to uh, ask several staff to live outside of the nursing home to buy the medicine for the uh, older people. So the, nurse, uh, the manager of the nursing home encountered uh, the, lackage, the lack of the uh, personnel during this academic period. And how about the doctors in the community health centers? Because they face the patients and face the people, uh, the residents directly. So they have to reduce the importation while stopping the transmission. And uh, they have a very heavy workload during this academic period. So um, according to their collaborative work, they work together to provide a, a comprehensive health and long-term care service to the elderly during uh, this epidemic period. So to sum up, the government uh, play a very important role in China to provide policy support, resource support, and public service support. And in the institutions, except for providing some regular and professional service, they also invite much more skilled stakeholders, including the relatives of the elderly. Some uh, el relatives are very positive because they believe it's safer for their parents to living in the institutions because the or the door open, the door closed. But others are very mad because they could not see their parents during this period. And how about in community? In the community, it calls for the collaboration between the community committee and the community health centers. Okay, last part is the initiatives of the emergency response plan. So uh, we separate the... Uh, shouting, and you might want to wrap up in a minute or so. Okay, okay, okay. So here is the ERP. The ERP, we separate the normal needs plus the special needs, uh, both in the nursing homes and in the communities. Okay, so give a very quick conclusion. We reconstruct this framework um, in our previous slides. So see here in the middle, so here are some research findings from our research. So uh, this research, we emphasize the importance of the local government's action. So it needs the most stakeholders to work together to satisfy the uh, need for the older people. So uh, the research is ongoing. So welcome uh, the uh, collaboration from the other countries. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Yating. Uh, Sorry, yes, to rush you a little bit. Yes. Um, so we'll be able to leave sufficient time. And certainly um, there will be some questions raised and people will pose um, to you and then we'll have our discussion later. Okay, um, thank you. All right, so last but not least, um, the fourth present presentation is on Mongolian hospital 
music therapy, effectiveness of psychosocial intervention in complex pal palliative care patients, a quasi experimental cohort single center study. Okay, the presenter is Professor or uh, Doctor uh, Bogin Dafa. And my apology if I pronounce your name incorrectly. Hello, hello, uh, everybody. Uh, my name is Sinu Purne. I am from Mongolia. I work in Hope Hospice in Uganda. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, uh, first of all, um, we will. Uh, Thank you for accepting our presentation in this uh, international webinars, mm -hmm. and also um, mostly thanking for give opportunity to um, attend this meeting uh, uh, for the Oyunga mm -hmm. presenter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then, um, uh, so um, in my uh, um, so I'm the uh, translator for the uh, Dr. Guru Chahal. So then um, um, she, she actually, um, uh, uh, she shifted me her presentation. So then I will uh, directly to um, present in English language uh, within time. <laughs> okay, so and then also thank you for organizing all um, you know, team members and uh, team leaders and also um, moderator um, Julian. Thank you for all of you. So let's start our presentation. Uh, so um, this research is uh, made in Hope Hospice, and then um, we wanted to um, uh, explain our music therapy effectiveness. So then we try to uh, compare the um, physical, uh, uh, psychosocial intervention for the palliative care patients. So then we did uh, experimental uh, uh, experiments. Uh, using uh, uh, music therapy. Mm -hmm. So then uh, our uh, studies uh, in only one center uh, and uh, our sample size was very small mm -hmm. so then we call that cohort study. Mm -hmm. So uh, firstly uh, I will uh, talk about the overview of our to uh, talking. So firstly mm -hmm. we talk about that our uh, Mongolian palliative care history and capacity so then secondly, we talk about our um, um, whole course, this uh, story. And then um, thirdly, we talk about uh, in music therapy in Mongolia. And then lastly, we talk about our research work. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now firstly, I will uh, uh, start with uh, um, uh, in what uh, palliative care in uh, development in Mongolian cases. So actually, in uh, since the 2000 years, oh, sorry, <laughs> it's changed. In, <laughs> okay. um, um, Mongolia began palliative care development in 2000 year with the creation of Mongolian Palliative Care Society and also Palliative Care Department. So uh, palliative care is included in uh, in the Mongolia's health law and also health insurance law and social welfare law. National Cancer Control Program and also National Program for Non-Communicable Diseases. Mm -hmm. And all these has approved in palliative care standards and also pain management guidelines. Mm -hmm. So palliative care ed education also in, included in the undergraduate and postgraduate uh, curriculum in all medical universities. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So then, um, um, in capacity of in, uh, our hope uh, uh, in uh, Mongolian uh, hospice, mm -hmm. I wanted to talk about now. Mm -hmm. So actually, we have six hospice units in Ulaanbaatar, mm -hmm. and it has uh, 50 beds. And each of nine districts mm -hmm. and all 21 provinces have up to four to five palliative care um, beds. And then there are 36 palliative care units, and also. Uh, one uh, total 190 beds for the three million in our entire people. So in 2015, uh, we have in a 
pediatric health care inpatient units established with the five beds. And also, um, essential drugs for health care have been available in Mongolia since 2015. So our pharmaceutical company uh, named you know, Ibico, uh, they produce morphine, codeine, and pethidine, and oxycodone in Ulaanbaatar. Mm -hmm. So then, mm, okay. okay, let's move next. Huh? Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, here is, I want to uh, say that in ranking of the um, palliative, uh, palliative care development, mm -hmm. So actually, in Mongolia, we are, uh, uh, according to the survey completed in 2007, uh, Mongolia ranked in 35th in the world in palliative care development. Mm -hmm. So then, uh, uh, palliative care takes a magpie approach and uh, borrowing from other medical disciplines and addressing a whole range of issues uh, at once and ranging from pain and other symptoms to spiritual and social and um, psychological support. Mm -hmm. Okay, next move. Okay. So, okay, now um, I will introduce uh, briefly about um, Hope Hospice uh, story. So actually, uh, Hope Hospice uh, in a private hospital, it's um, established in 2000 year, uh, 2003 years, mm -hmm. and then in between Mongolian Christian doctors, uh, good act organizations as a whole process project. Mm -hmm. So at that time, GS, GCS International Organization uh, nurse Helen Shepherd and Dr. Aftan Horikur newly organized this hospice. Mm -hmm. So after two years later, Hope was uh, privately branched out. And then 2007, under Dr. Burun leading Hope Hospice, and uh, it was a non-government organization. So then, uh, in 2016, it had national health insurance coverage, and it has now 15 beds private hospital. So then, uh, actually, since 2004 mm -hmm. to till today, we have given palliative care service for around 9,000 patients. Mm -hmm. Okay, next one. Okay, she wanted to actually, um, little wanted to introduce you about her um, uh, building. So here is, you can see, entrance of Hope Hospice, and then um, um, patient rooms and doctor's room. Okay, next one. Mm -hmm. And actually, um, Hope Hospice is um, cooperated with uh, many humanitarian uh, organizations. So then uh, she received um, a very huge <laughs> awards uh, from the Rotary Humanitarian Award, uh, which is uh, the name of award is the D1. Uh, and uh, from the Hong Kong, she received uh, this award in 2015. Mm -hmm. And then she received the 50,000 uh, US dollar uh, to with these uh, awards, and then she purchased her uh, buildings. Mm -hmm. And then, um, okay, so um, also we wanted to, ah, oh, sorry, next one. Mm -hmm. So then, um, uh, we think that uh, Mongolian music therapy is not so much uh, developed in our country, we think that, but when we search out uh, this uh, find uh, information, uh, so we really uh, surprised. And then, actually, our social workers is very active for the music therapy, mm -hmm. and they um, learned techniques, and then they teach the uh, they using their activity for this music therapy for women, elderly people, and also with the dis disability families and all the communities. So then they, they all 21 provincial, um, all the social workers um, activity included this music therapy activity. Mm -hmm. So these findings actually, um, uh, um, this is mentioned with uh, this Leslie Ann Shepherd Chamberlain, mm -hmm. uh, who uh, came from the American uh, Music Therapy Association's lady, she uh, actually mentioned about these sentences. So then I want, we wanted to show this. Um, uh, 
in all minutes. Okay, next. Okay, so, okay, let's talk about our research now. Mm -hmm. Final <laughs> session. So then, um, actually, we wanted to know uh, um, this uh, palliative care patients uh, psychosocial intervention, how it will be uh, changed during uh, their um, uh, music therapy time. So then we measured that pain and also we uh, uh, evaluate their emotional distresses. So then, okay, next one. So then, actually, uh, we just uh, showed f uh, very few people's uh, data, and then um, here's like we have uh, 15 people uh, newly admitted uh, inpatient hospice houses. So then they can uh, complete questionnaires and respond verbally and also uh, consent to participate in the study. So then, uh, actually, diagnosis of uh, people. Uh, included cancer and heart disease and stroke and Alzheimer diseases. So we uh, divided uh, two groups, the Alzheimer and also um, cancer and uh, stroke groups. Like this, and, uh, we divided in two groups. So then, um, and we measured uh, these parameters that uh, profile of mood states. So, which is included these four parameters that mood, anxiety, and suffering, and distress. And then um, uh, we provided uh, music therapy for at least uh, five hours uh, music therapy they received in, within seven days hospitalization. And then music technique, uh, I mean music therapy technique was uh, the listening to music, relaxation to music, and also playing instruments, live review activities, and song composition and improvisations. And um, uh, we wanted to uh, express our limitation of this uh, study. So actually, we have a very uh, small sample size. And uh, we think that this is lack of persistent randomization. So it is important to conduct future research with uh, larger sample sizes. Mm -hmm. And then um, it will allow for more rigorous statistical analysis uh, and general generalization of uh, the results. We think. Mm -hmm. Okay, next one, please. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, um, this uh, now uh, the uh, few slides are included in the pictures. So this is um, actually included with the, the music um, techniques. So here is Burunja, Dr. Burunjara and her um, colleagues. Uh, they using um, instruments and then they uh, make activity for the music therapy. Okay, next please. Okay, and uh, this uh, also showing the technique of relaxation to music and playing instruments. Mm -hmm. And then next one. And also light review activities, and also song composition and improvisations. So light review activities actually to speaking, talk with their life, and mm -hmm. this kind of activities we are doing while listening music. And you know. okay, then next please. Okay, so um, now allow me to express the methods. So. Um, Mm -hmm. Actually, we called a uh, quasi experimental, so it's like uh, you know, we did uh, music therapy, music therapy mm -hmm. as an experimental <laughs> cases, like uh, in a um, clinical experiment, we made it. So then, uh, it's like, um, it, so then uh, we called quasi experimental, and then, um, uh, we uh, tested music therapy for before uh, treatment. Uh, no, uh, we uh, evaluate, uh, measured uh, for uh, uh, psychosocial intervention for the uh, uh, before uh, before treatment and after treatment uh, for the uh, mood, anxiety, and emotional distress. 
and uh, we class, uh, classified uh, patients as a complex and non-complex uh, groups. So complex group has uh, included four uh, parameters, and non-complex group um, um, at least two or three parameters included. So then we call that non-complex um, group. So then groups compared to assess changes in the suffering related parameters on the baseline. Mm -hmm. Next one, please. Okay, mm -hmm. so allow me to introduce results. So um, here is, uh, this table shows that um, participants' social demographic parameters. So we have 15 patients, uh, I mean 15 participants, uh, which, uh, which uh, were uh, nine female and six males. Mm -hmm. And uh, their average um, uh, age was, uh, female average age was 62.5 and male was 65.23. So then, um, um, actually, uh, previously I mentioned that we uh, divided two groups uh, in a diagnosis. So Alzheimer's diseases uh, group included seven people, and then uh, with cancer and stroke people group included eight people. So we find out that um, uh, these findings that uh, ten, from these 15 people to 10 people, um, shows the significant differences supporting this use of music therapy. Uh, and then uh, we uh, pre-test and protest with a visual analog, uh, analog scale that's used in our uh, study. So then uh, Wilkinson's method we used for the statistical analysis. Mm -hmm. So then, um, next please. Okay, so then, um, uh, as, as I mentioned previously, that visual analog uh, scale, so this will be exact same as with the one baker cases pain rating scales. So then, um, this scale used for the this psychosocial intervention parameters. So um, here, as you can see, our divided groups, complex and non complex group, and uh, they have. Uh, before treatment, they have four to five points in each, uh, three to five points in each um, groups. So after uh, uh, treatment, um, after uh, treatment, their uh, this scale, one Baker scale, uh, is decreased one to uh, three points. So then, uh huh. It's mostly to be uh, um, very interesting findings, find out that in a complex uh, groups of people's uh, Alzheimer uh, diagnosis people, uh, their suffering uh, intervention is more decreased in the, uh, comparing to other groups. Okay, next please. So uh, this diagram is actually showed that these uh, two groups, uh, psychosocial interventions uh, parameters, uh, to be as shown as a very uh, easily, uh, I mean very simply, and then uh, so as I mentioned previously, conflicts at time of diseases uh, is more uh, effective as showing in the other groups, uh, comparing to other groups. So then, uh, as uh, we compared. Um, uh, two groups in a pre-test and a post-test uh, groups, uh, as in the SM ratio, we find out. So then, um, um, that uh, pain scales of SM ratio was the more uh, higher than the other groups in the complex Alzheimer's diseases. As you can see in for here, uh, uh, a blue uh, diagram, and then. Uh, this group was more effective in the other groups compared to. Mm -hmm. So next one. Okay, so here uh, we wanted to show that our parameters baseline uh, um, using in uh, one baker basis. So then uh, we find uh, we pointed out 2.5 and 5 uh, point were our baseline uh, parameters. Uh, so if uh, uh, 
two, um, uh, less than 2.5 um, points if A got it, uh, verbally said, it will be indicating that um, the uh, pain was relieving. Um, and then if more than five points they got uh, verbally said, and it, it was uh, it will indicating that uh, pain was more higher than other uh, higher than pain. So average is 4.25 points. Mm -hmm. And then we, uh, using this uh, parameter, uh, baseline parameters for our um, statistical analysis. So after successive uh, psychosocial interventions, the level of suffering complex patients decreased until, until close to parity with non-complex patients and also uh, complex patients. Mm -hmm. So then um, this will suggest that major complexity could be most mm -hmm. from specific psychosocial treatment. Mm -hmm. And then these findings support mm -hmm. the importance of accessing and treating uh, the, uh, the patients of in, in the flight care needs. And also palliative care development continues to improve the quality mm -hmm. of life mm -hmm. of uh, palliative patients and families in Mongolia. So thank you for your attention and <laughs> Okay, thank you so much. And again, if, for the audience, please submit your questions to Jenny. And we have compiled some of the questions already to the earlier speaker. And let me go through this real quick. Okay, so some of the questions are more specific to the speaker for and okay, so there are a couple of questions regarding the measures. And um, one specifically asking about the physical and mental health measure. Do you see any sex differences amongst the elder? And also related to that question is what kind of biomarker the wells are uh, study measures, and I know you mentioned in your presentation that um, it's quite really, yeah, detailed with over almost 100 different items, but if you can just, in general. Oh, thank you. I think uh, there are gender differences, and usually it depends on the specific domain. In terms of the overall uh, score, actually uh, men and women are not that different slightly uh, better uh, in certain countries for men and slightly better in certain countries for women. But overall, the difference is relatively small. I think income and education uh, have a lot more effect and impact on the overall well score. Keep in mind, the physical health is a self-reported self-assessment. And uh, the mental health, we have lots of mental health or uh, sort of emotional health related questions. So we will be able to dig into that. We also have a lot of self-reported of self-satisfaction. And of course, men and women have different perception and they respond differently, but not so much uh, reflected in the total score. Uh, and we will uh, look into this a little bit more. We haven't really focused very much on the elderly population yet, but this is so important. So we will uh, put in more effort to look at this more carefully. The second question is about biomarkers. I, I am actually a molecular epidemiologist rather than a behavior scientist, but right now I lead this uh, very large cohort with very large biobank. So I feel there is a tremendous opportunity for us to learn more about the biology of well-being. So we are actually looking at uh, various things. Of course, in the future, one will be genetic uh, predisposition. In terms of biomarkers, we also have metabolomics profiling. We have collected stool samples. So we have some pilot studies on microbiomes. And then uh, we also currently are collaborating with UCSF on telomere length. 
and also inflammation markers and mediators and also immune profiles. So these are the things that currently come to mind that we will tackle and seek funding for these uh, measurements. Of course, there are many other things that uh, there there are the proteomics and uh, trans transcriptome. Those are the things we will also pursue uh, in the future. But in 2021, our focus is metabolomics, microbiomes, and immune markers. Great, thank you. And um, the next set of questions actually are also directed to you, but I think it's applicable to all our other three presenters. So I will ask the question and, and maybe you can start off with um, answering and then I will invite the other three speakers to come in and comment on it. Okay, the question is specifically to Anne is, what do you think about the possible differences within the culture of the three regions in China, Taiwan, and Singapore? And related to that, and that's the second part of the question that I would like to invite the other speaker to talk a little bit about, is the impact of public health system on some of those results that you find differences across different regions. So in Xiaoting's case, for example, as you have mentioned about really the tension between medical care and public health, and similarly in the Mongolian uh, situation as well. And so, so again, Anne, if you don't mind, and you can start off and based on your own observation, the differences in terms of, in the context of culture between the region in your study. Currently, what we see is actually Taiwan and China are more si similar compared to Singapore because Singapore has three ethnic groups as many Chinese and Malay and also Indians. And so that has more the multicultural aspect. So I, I think uh, uh, also, I think economy and also uh, family setting and social connectedness in these different countries, in all of the countries, social connectedness is very, very important for one's well-being. But in different countries, the social network, social connectedness, uh, may manifest in different forms. And so in China and Taiwan, it's mostly family. Singapore is in between. In the US, it's actually most, a lot of the folks actually have their social support from their friends rather than their family. And of course, uh, so it, it, I think it all really depends on uh, the structure of uh, the system, the economy, and also family setting. And we also see very interestingly in China, especially in Taiwan is family support could be a double-edged uh, sword. It provides more support for the young people, especially the younger people, but also provide, uh, also result in a lot of social burden. So we are seeing social support. We are also seeing social burden. And so all of these need to take into account to enhance well-being in the future. And different, different age groups have different issues. And the reason I, I chose to present very positive uh, pictures for elderly is this is exactly what we are seeing in our data. And I, I just feel for the young people, they are the sandwich uh, generation. So actually in our data is showing that the younger population actually have uh, all of the uh, lower scores, all of the domains and the lower total score. Uh, socially, emotionally, I guess they are very much burdened. So that's also another population in the future. I hope that we will be able to look into and provide some support. Thank you, Anne. So if, with respect to the question then, really uh, the tension between medical care and public health and in the context of healthy aging, um, I wonder whether the other speakers would like to comment on it. Okay, uh, Julian, yeah, I have something. Uh, the first of all, uh, uh, in order to answer your first question about the culture, uh, I think it's very important in the Asia countries, including China. So our uh, in our research, although we encourage the public service or the social service, but I think the most important thing is to encourage the family policies to support the family caregivers is very important. The Chinese government started to encourage the business 
business to build up more welfare centers, the nursing homes. But the weakness is our community because more than 90% of elderly are living in the community. That's the culture. So when we are talking about uh, this, I think uh, I have the ca a case. When we doing survey in the rural areas in China, we provide the meal to the older people. I mean, the lunch to the old, older people by the government subsidies. It's good, but the children they will say, "I will not go to back to see my parents because you provide the meal." So that's we have to rethinking of the traditional culture, right? It's the first question. Is my response. The second one, how to link the public health? What's the function of public health and the medicine? The integrate. I think uh, in the past 10 years, WHO have a report to evaluate China's 10 years of healthcare reform to identify the biggest the major problem for China is our chronic disease. The burden, disease burden of chronic disease that's related to the population aging as well as the public health. So especially in the communities and all, as well as in the rural areas, how to improve the ability of the doctors and the nurses in the local level is very important. Also from my research, the need assessment from the elderly. I'm very surprised to the older people, they need the health advisor, the preventive health services. Uh, so and this asks us to rethinking of our health system, the holistic health system, we put much more resources on the hospitals, but we have to transfer from the hospital centered to the community centered. Thank you. Thank you, Xiaoting. Uh, Yuanke and our colleague, can you, you like to comment from um, your research and also from the Mongolian perspective? Sure, just uh, to add a little bit. So similar to other Asian countries, uh, our seniors or older adults is highly respected. So um, that's a good thing. Uh, but the culture is changing where the younger population is leaving for better education, for better job. And in the rural community especially, it leaves the older adults alone with very limited opportunity to be close with their own um, family or with other people. So um, even though it's highly respected and just because number of uh, older adults is so little, only, as I said, only 6%, attention, getting help or getting resources uh, allocated is very, very challenging right now. So, um, and then the research, when we did it about among the 400 people, when we grouped that by age, 16 below and 60 to 70 and 70 and above, we were very also surprised that the younger uh, group uh, indicated the highest need. We couldn't figure that out, but it, it seemed like the younger uh, um, cohort uh, realizing that, okay, our children are leaving or we are get, have le way less children to take care of, of us when we, are, when we need it. They actually indicated highest need uh, uh, when we asked that. So that was a... a surprise to us, but at the same time, it also showed that people are starting to think about it, uh, even though the, our culture is there, just the, uh, you know, the pursuit of the higher education and jobs, etc., is causing uh, older adults to be, they have to start taking care of themselves and looking at other options as an alternative. Yeah. <clears throat> So, so it seems like actually, yeah, then the role of family really, yeah, is quite important, no matter in what aspect, I mean, making the connections and helping actually the general well-being. So one of the questions that was posted to Yu Yanka specifically is, um, for the older adults in Mongolia, and if they do not have family and friends, since the whole cultural context is so yeah, familial-oriented. Um, how do they actually yeah, get help? And what kind of actually support network or system in place? 
So, um, a good question uh, because we do have one. The Mongolian term, the closest it will come to, is a nursing home, but it really doesn't have a lot of medical help. Is uh, what I would call um, the last option place, where it's away from the city, about a four-hour drive from Lambatar to go, and it's totally funded by the government. It's for people who really have no family to take care of them, and and uh, that's the only place they can go. And that also is a difficult because with the term nursing home, when we're trying to uh, introduce about this potential services at the same time, our, some participants had the negative idea, okay, this is the last place with no family, no money, where it's 100% provided by government. Is, is that what you're asking? So we had to clarify, no, it's not the case. So, yeah, so it is, we do have that one place in, as I said, in a little bit away from the city as the last resource for people to go. Great. Thank you. And there's also one question to uh, Dr. Bodesh. Um, Bodesh. Um, um, the hospice study. So what kind of music do you use? You use Mongolian folk music? Uh, on the slide, it showed that uh, um, the, the musician was playing guitar. <laughs> So the question then was rated for kind of music. Uh, sorry, I just got a text from uh, Dr. Burung Jaragal that in the place that she's at, uh, the internet, they just lost the power. So she's ah. not, uh, she got disconnected, but uh, just uh, with a little bit of familiar with her work, because I used to collaborate with her. It is a uh, Mongolian music, yes. Using the most available music, which is the guitar, and I have heard their songs. It is a local Mongolian music they play, and it's a familiar songs to the patients. Yes. Great. Yeah. So let's see. Then there's another question that um, every all the speaker perhaps yeah been able to address is. Okay, so one question is, aging is really not just about older adults. So the best preparation for aging is throughout life. And has anyone done any research or what is your thought on the connection between the younger generation and the older generation, particularly in the context, again, of Asia? Um, do you see any promising transgenerational well-being type of intervention? Um, so the last two minutes um, that we have left, and perhaps yes, <laughs> our speaker can <laughs> comment on that. <laughs> Cross-generation collaboration. Yeah, so um, I'm actually also, when I'm in Hawaii, University of Hawaii, uh, East West Center and Osher School, we do collaboration. So we have events like a board game event when uh, older adults from Osher School come and international students coming from different around the world that coming to University East West Center we collaborate and have a wonderful evening, couple of events. And it on both surveys or when we have a little bit of feedback for the international students who are coming to Hawaii for educational purpose, just having that local American uh, grandparent uh, feeling, having that engagement, having fun together was best part of their uh, two-week visit, for example. And then same thing for the OSHER. Uh, older adults, they learn the games uh, um, in the class first, but then they have so much fun when they play with the younger generation. They they love the energy of the younger people and they compete against each other. And they they had a blast. Similar thing in Mongolia when we took the board games to rural community. 
you know, we gather just community members from different age and teach them the same game together. And all generations love it. It's new to both all um, groups. And it's just a great uh, way to do. And then also, when it's intergenerational, it seems to even have more impact, positive impact, instead of just having, you know, age, a similar age group, at least in our experience, that has been the case. Right. Anything that Anne or Xiaoxin would like to add? And we are about time. Uh, it goes talk, and I know. I just want to kudos uh, Professor Chow, Winston, and Coverly because they hosted such a, an excellent and wonderful session. I learned so much and enjoyed it immensely. So thank you so much. Thank you for your time. <laughs> okay, great. So again, uh, thank you so much for all of our speakers. Uh, we'll give you a okay. big round of applause. And for the audience, and yes, um, the conversation will be here on healthy aging will continue, and definitely. Um, it's a global, actually, phenomenon. Um, in the United States, there are much, much, much more that we can learn from our country in Asia. And so we will definitely um, keep our dialogue. And hopefully, one of those days, then our, our path will cross again. And we'll see you all either online or in person somewhere. So again, no matter where you are right now, when there is a sunset, there is sunrise. Have a good evening and good morning, wherever, wherever you are. Thank and you. Fa finally, we really would like to acknowledge the heroes behind and everything that's Kevin and also Jenny Chen and Winston, yes. and also mm -hmm. Professor uh, Chen Rui Rong at mm -hmm. National Taiwan University. Okay. Good night. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Take Thank care. Thank you so Bye -bye. much. Bye -bye.